Bobrovsky, Barkov, and Dreisaitl. A game six out of nowhere. What momentum, what pressure, what tension means with the cup in the building and Florida reaching out and Edmonton staving, staving. Let's go around the horn. <laughs> Martensi Johnson, where have you been all my life? Great to have you back. In high down in Milwaukee. Oh. First team all smile on the around the horn ranking. Martensi Johnson, that's why I love you. Oilers Panthers, how about a game six tonight? The fascination of a team with all the momentum and belief in themselves so suddenly after being down 0-3 and opposite a team still 60 minutes away from heaven and all of their dreams coming true but for two straight games lost and now pressure rising. Tim Kalashaw around the horn of you. What does momentum, pressure, tension mean in a game six? And what is the most important thing tonight with Edmonton trying Ooh. to restave and the Panthers trying to hoist? More staving, yes. I think, coming Love ahead. It. We'll see. You know, <laughs> I I've said many times, hockey series, hockey playoffs, there really isn't momentum. It's a hot goalie. Mm -hmm. It's a game-to-game -game mm -hmm. thing. That idea is wrong occasionally. As it was in the Dallas Stars Edmonton oh, series, Dallas, yes. has, Dallas has full control, winning two to one, the series two to one, and then winning game four, and suddenly Edmonton's power play gets going, and and everything about Edmonton's confidence goes one way, and the other team sinks going the other way, and we've seen the same thing here. Only it happened after a 3-0 lead, and you think, well, Florida's too dominant. They're not. They're not going to let Edmonton and McDavid and the power play get in their heads. And they're completely in their heads mm. now. Uh, Florida played a poor game in game five when everybody thought it'd just be a go home for the coronation. Mm. And now mm. they got to try to to avoid game seven. They got to try to win in Canada. And, it's and you're circling tough. the Edmonton power play, it sounds like. Everybody picked Florida in game five. Is that true? Harry, is that true? Ah, uh, <laughs> Harry Lyles, welcome around the horn. And now, please, the one you thing know. tonight. Yeah, I like to consider myself more of a sports meteorologist, if you will. You know, I'm, I'm paid to be in the ballpark, not necessarily to get it right. Uh, either way, though, I, I am just – I understand Edmonton is the team that is facing elimination tonight, but I cannot help but feel like all of the pressure is on Florida because I don't even know that Edmonton expected that they would be in this position in part because of the incredible play – of Connor McDavid, who, if you take all 21 of the players for Florida that have touched the ice in games four and five, he has almost played on par with them. He has three goals. They have four. He has five assists. They have six. Like, mm. if one guy is basically playing up to the production of 21 guys on your own team, that is absolutely incredible. I think you still need a little bit more out of Leon Dreisaitl, but I'm going to go with Edmonton. Today. Oh, there it is. And it's not a flip-flop. No, no. It's it's taking in new information, it's recalibrating in all sorts of yes. ways like a, like a great meteorologist would. All right, Martensi Johnson, now to you. You've heard two panelists. They believe in momentum. They believe in pressure. How do you see it? Uh, I think the most pressure is on the team that if they lose tonight, the series is over. So I'm going to say Edmonton <laughs> okay. has obviously the most pressure. Now, again, Florida doesn't want to put themselves in a position to have to play yet another game and travel 2,500 miles back to Florida. But at the same mm -hmm. time, there's some positives to get out of this. Now, Bobrovsky has given up those nine goals in the last two games, but he gave up just four in the previous three. So he can get back to that. But the problem has been the penalties and the mistakes by his teammates that put him in a position to give up those nine goals. 11 penalties in the last two games have contributed to three power play goals. You cannot have that if you want to win. So if they stop the mistakes and get back to the Florida Panthers, who won in six in the previous uh, series, won in six the previous series before that, mm, they can win in okay. six. Okay, all right. That's interesting. You believe the pressure still is on Edmonton because if they lose, it's over. Bill Barnwell on pressure, on tension, on momentum on game six tonight. There is pressure on the Florida Panthers because it feels like it's all unraveling, right? This was a team that had everything going for them, and then Connor McDavid showed up to this series. And so I believe mm -hmm. this has to be Operation Stop Connor McDavid at all costs. And the way you do that is you do something that Paul Maurice did earlier in this series and reunite Matthew Tichuk with Alexander Barkov. Their two best players play on two separate lines, which makes sense against McDavid and Dreitseidel. But right now, Dreitseidel has not shown up. This is a McDavid series. Series. You bring to Chuck, who has the best expected goal rate of any Florida Panthers player in even strength during this postseason. Put him on that line, get more physical with McDavid, and dare 
Leon Dreitzeidel, who again has been pretty quiet this entire series, dare him to beat mm. your second line without the chuck. Mm -hmm. Make a pick for tonight, Bill Barnwell. I am going with the Panthers because I believe they're like Baker Mayfield. They play better when nobody believes in them. Okay, yeah, maybe Baker Mayfield not involved in this conversation. I think Panthers fans might say. Kalisha, how about you? Edmonton, take it back to Florida. Harry, you've already Let's picked go. Edmonton and Martenzi, the conductor of this symphony. You've got that uh, baton pen in your hand. Take it to us. Who do you got tonight? I'm giving the Panthers. I feel like Michael Irvin here. Everyone doesn't believe in you. What are you going to okay. do? Okay, Michael Irvin also involved in this conversation. Let's see. Let's talk about last night. Rick Wood Field, Major League Baseball's tribute to the Negro Leagues. A tribute on Fox, which showed very well, especially when they went to black and white in, in a lot of people's eyes. But our Clinton Yates there on assignment, and he filed to Anscape. This was not some kumbaya moment for the most part. Yeah, it's great to recognize the efforts on the field of players who paved the way for others. But the truth is that for a lot of these guys, the experience opened wounds to the most traumatizing experiences of their lives. Mm. That's certainly underlined by the moment with Reggie Jackson on Fox's pregame. Coming back here is not easy. The racism that I played here, when I played here, the, the difficulty of going through different places where we traveled. I walked into restaurants and they would point at me and said, the nigger can't eat here. I would go to a hotel and they say, the nigger can't stay here. We went to Charlie Finley's country club for a welcome home dinner and they pointed me out with the N-word. He can't come in here. Finley marched the whole team out. Fortunately, I had a manager and I had players on the team that helped me get through it. But I wouldn't wish it on anybody. Mm. How to unpack all of that around the horn to Martenzi Johnson. Yeah, I can start by saying I'll give credit where credit is due. I thought it was a beautiful game that MLB put on, renovating Rookwood uh, and then bringing the MLB game to it. Um, I thought that donating 500000 to the Southern Negro League Museum is great steps, and you're honoring the two remaining living members from the Negro League. So all of that is great. But I thought Reggie Jackson brought us back to reality a little bit. Um, there's this old adage that, you know, you can stab me in the back and pull it out, and you see that as progress, but it still leaves a scar. And Reggie Jackson is kind of identifying that scar right there where, yes, we've moved on. There's no, you know, formal uh, color barrier in baseball anymore. We've progressed as a society, but the people who went through those things like Reggie Jackson did and Willie Mays did and so on and so forth, they're still alive. They still live with those scars. Their families still live with those scars. So we can celebrate MLB, which again, I thought they did an excellent job, but I thought that uh, Reggie brought us back to reality mm -hmm. a little bit. And so that showed that progress, while it's great, it's not complete. Parallels Jr.? I think the things that stood out to me about what Reggie Jackson said, one, I, I think it's important for people to note part of why I think this was jarring for some people is that this happened just 20 years after Jackie Robinson integrated the game. Uh, the second piece of that, I, I think that was very important to hear um, his uncensored, unfiltered experience of this is that so oftentimes, whether it is in school or through textbooks, things of that nature, you hear about these racist experiences and you hear black people being applauded for looking the other way or turning the other cheek or just staying strong when he also, we didn't play it in the clip there, but he talked about if I would have acted on my emotions, basically, I don't know that I would be here. He mentioned he might have been mm -hmm. in an oak tree. So I think for people to hear a holistic and real experience like that is very important and perhaps doesn't happen enough as it pertains to the game. Major League Baseball is in a unique position because we tie them with one of the darkest points in American history in a way that we don't really do with other sports in North America, which is rightfully so for a number of different reasons that we can't get into today. Uh, but I think the one thing that has been their biggest issue is that for so long they have run from that and also minimized that. And so to be in a place where you are bringing in a bunch of black players, both old and new, because that is a fraternity that I don't think how people realize how unique that is, to be able to go there and not just say, hey, this is Negro League baseball history, but that this is all of baseball history, I think is an important distinction that you've also seen them take as they have integrated the stats mm -hmm. in. So I think this is a right step for baseball and something that they will never be able to completely correct. Tim Kalashaw? Yeah, I mean, I thought it was very important for everyone, including me, to hear 
because as somebody as the oldest person on this yeah. panel, I remember Reggie's entire career, right. and he he broke he came broke in with the Kansas City A's 20 years after Jackie Robinson made it with the Brooklyn Dodgers. I don't associate Reggie with those players who suffered. I th I think of Reggie in the 70s with the A's and then with the Yankees and benefiting from free agency and you know hit him hitting a home run. What are you thinking about? And him saying the magnitude of me. I'm thinking that's Reggie's life. But before that, he did endure these things in the South. Even in the, you know, in the mid, mid to late 60s, this stuff is still happening at the minor league level. And, and so it, it's a reminder that not everything ended in 1947 when Jackie Robinson crossed that barrier. And Bill Bonewell. Feels a lot like Major League Baseball wants to theme park away the, the racist elements of their past and the past of baseball. Um, we saw a couple weeks ago the Negro League stats becoming uh, as similar as Major League stats. That didn't do much for the players who were discriminated against 50, 60, 70, 80 years ago. Um, we saw a celebration of baseball in Birmingham, which is great, but did not actually reckon with the racism that was inherent there, which Reggie Jackson spoke about. And I fear with, with two, Negro, uh, two living Negro League players left, um, with players like Reggie now aging, who have those experiences from the past, even players today who are experiencing racism in different ways, it feels like Major League Baseball, if they really cared about this issue, if they really want to change things and create an open this, creating an honesty, giving people spaces to tell their stories is incredibly valuable. Harry Lyles, a, a last word, please. Yeah, Tony, I called Marlon Anderson, who played a number of years in Major League Baseball, and uh, just asked him for his perspective on everything with this. And he said it was very important for all of us to be able to gather in one place and for us to be acknowledged as a part of the game. Because even when he played in the late 90s and early 2000s, he felt like that was a challenge for him. So for him to be able to feel that, I think, is an important step as we progress with baseball. Mm -hmm. One quick clarification. Two players, Bill and Martenzi, you alluded to. The living Negro League players who played from 1920 to 1948, that span that Major League Baseball just incorporated their stats. Bill Greeson and Ron Teasley, we saw them on the field last night. They were joined by a few dozen other Negro League players who played in the time period after, and it was wonderful to see them all. Take a break here, buy or sell. Next. Nothing better than a late June NBA trade. The Thunder Bulls deal. Let's go around the horn. OKC landing Alex Caruso. Chicago, Josh Giddy. Kalisha, who do you buy it for? Who do you sell it for? Oh, I buy it for Oklahoma City. Uh, Caruso, just another defensive guard who fits into that uh, mentality they have there with Luke Dort, Kaysun Wallace, and the rest. I think about game six against Dallas, that Dallas won by a point. If they'd had Caruso instead of Giddy, who just could not shoot in the series, three for 16 on threes and a bad defensive player, that might have made mm. all the difference. Harry Lyles Jr. I'm absolutely buying Oklahoma City here. Sam Presti is a god in this, truly, because you are trading somebody who still looks like he could be a promising player, but your team is so rich with talent that you don't need him. To Kalashaw's point, his Dallas Mavericks just stopped guarding the guy to a point where they had to bench him, and now you replace him with a guy that is a defensive stopper. You put him along with Lou Dort and Kaysan Wallace, other defensive stoppers, and you've got three weapons on offense in SGA, Chet Holmgren and Jalen Williams. The Oklahoma City Thunder are set up for long-term mm -hmm. success. Martenzi Johnson? Um, like everyone else, I, I'm buying for the Thunder here. That starting five now, if Caruso is in it, that gives Boston a run for his money as far as just defensive starting fives. Like, mm. they're that good. Okay. Um, I, I'm selling for the Bulls. I, I don't know exactly what they're doing. They did not get a first-round pick out of this. Uh, I'm, I'm assuming DeRozan's gone, and Lonzo Ball just picked up his player option, but he's putting the player in player option because I'm not sure the Bulls yeah. even wanted him back. So, so you, yeah, you think Chicago should have got a pick. Did OKC have any picks to trade? I, I don't, I'm not sure if we can <laughs> count on two hands. <laughs> Bill Bardwell, how about you? I buy this trade for OKC. This is the moment they shift from being a team that's just accumulating assets with all their draft picks to actually building a championship caliber team in reality when it comes to their roster. Now in Caruso, they have that lockdown perimeter defender who can go up against uh, Anthony Edwards, who can go up against Luka Doncic if they need to for an entire series. And Josh Giddy, they were moving him to the bench anyway. Josh Giddy apparently requested a trade after he got this news from OKC. So I don't think they're gonna miss him all that much in the big picture. Buy or sell too. Let's talk NFL and the idea to increase the games in the season to 18. 
You know they went from 16 to 17 a few years ago. Now, 17 to 18 is the idea. There appears to be a divide among players. Bill Barnwell, what you buy, what you sell? Don't buy that there's a divide amongst players. I, I buy that the players only want this if they're going to get something in return, and it has to be something significant. It can't just be a minor addition. Maybe it's 50% of league revenue. Maybe they get 70% of the revenue for this 18th game. Maybe they get two bye weeks. Maybe they get a, an increase in the rookie wage scale, where players are massively underpaid for the majority of their careers in most cases. It has to be something significant, because for the owners, they desperately want this is billions of dollars of revenue if the owners push this through. And knows money. It's Bill Barnwell. Martenzi Johnson, what do you buy? What do you sell from uh, an 18 game NFL season? Yeah, I'm buying this one just because the NFL seems to be soft launching it on the Pat McAfee show. So it's probably going to happen. ESPN did a survey of players, and nearly half of them want this or are okay with it. Um, so if that's the case, then it's likely going to happen. But like Bill says, get some concessions out of this, um, whether it's, like you said, 50-50 split or something with the rookie wage scale. But also, I just want to point out one thing I'm selling on is the, the NFL is about player safety, at least they say that. And I go back to a 2010 quote from Ray Lewis saying, we are not machines. If it's 17 games and it's 18 games, what stops 19 and 20? At a certain point, the NFL has to be a little less greedy and just be fine with the product that they have. Harry Lowe's Jr. I, I do buy that there is somewhat of, of a line here with NFL players on this particular issue because I actually called a guy that is on a one-year prove-it deal right now, and he says there's two basically sides to this coin. One is that for guys like him that are still trying to prove themselves, you still want that third preseason game to show that you can actually play in this league and then get that big contract. But he also said then, if I knew I was already on the roster, I didn't need to prove anything, and you tell me I'm going to get one more game check, I will absolutely take that, and you can get rid of your preseason game. So no matter what happens here, I do think that the players need to try to get something out of this. If I were them, they're absolutely not going to get this, but you need to put guaranteed contracts on the table and at least get a no from the NFL for that, because to me it is still absolutely ridiculous that these guys do not get that. Inside information, actual reporting from Harry Lyles Jr. and Tim Callishaw. Yeah, yeah I, I think that no, they'll get on guaranteed contracts will come loud and clear very, very quickly. I, I don't expect them to get much. They'll probably get rid of mini camps, something like that, something players hate. Uh, but 18 games with two buys, that's a lot of buys. That's 64 buys. Plays hell with your fantasy team. I don't look forward to that. But uh, that's not, you know, I, I just think it's going to happen. They already do it in Canada. They play 18 games there. A lot of buys. Do it here. Tim, give us one more buy. Bye. Bye. Oh, okay. yes. Bill Barnwell, bye bye. Showdown, Martenzi Johnson, Harry Lowe's Jr. A parade for the champs in Boston. There were duck boats. Derek White showed off his new teeth. He didn't get them fixed at the parade, but. Somehow had time for dental in the last two days. And Al Horford wore a cowboy hat. Harry, among the things you saw and you're still seeing, what stood out to you most from this parade? Celtics. Tony is absolutely Derek White. They won a championship on Monday, immediately got on a plane to go to Miami. They're on the floats today, and somehow Derek White was able to get his teeth fixed. To me, that tells a lot of people, you should also probably find a way to get to the dentist if that guy can. Mm, Martenzi. Harry, you stole my thing, but I'm going to roll with it. I'm going to say Derek White, too, because Derek White is a better than, man than me. Because if I lose a tooth, one, I'm not finishing that game. I'm not finishing that series. And I'm not showing up for the parade because my mouth still Oh, hurts. come on. Yeah, I go the other way. You know, you, you rock the gapped tooth situation as long as you possibly can. That's There's no better look for a celebrating parade than... than these are the money makers. I hear you. You got the best smile in the game. I said this before. Look at these guys with these smiles. Showdown too. First team ever to hit a walk-off home run in the ninth for three consecutive games. Home games, of course. The San Diego Padres. Cronenworth following up Higashioka and Merrill. An MLB record, Martenzi. Is it more impressive or fluky? It's fluky, but I am impressed. Impressed so much that I might just turn on the TV at 9.40 p.m. Eastern tonight to see if they do it again. <laughs> the odds are yeah. low, but I'm still going to uh -huh. tune in. Rob Manfred right. wants to hear that. I feel like calling this fluky takes the fun out of it. In fact, I would say it's more impressive the fact that they did not do any of these in extra innings. They did all of this in regulation in nine yeah. innings. And plus, yeah. imagine how cool it is to be able to say you're one of the fans that was at every single one of these games. Clearly, you're their good luck charm. Mm. Impressive. Not a fluke.
for Harry Lyles to get that point. We'll move on. Raiders tailgate party shack. Take a look at this. Just, they're going for $20,000, by the way, for the outside the stadium pregame. You're, you're seeing, you know, it's going to be all inclusive. You're paying $20,000 for this party shack. Harry, is this a good idea? Tony, some people might call this an idea. Other people say in Oxford, Mississippi, the Grove would call this culture. This is not new to them. Welcome to the Las <laughs> Vegas Raiders, to the SEC. But $20,000? They're not charging that in the SEC. Go ahead, Martenzi. For $20,000, I'm not going to a Raiders game. I'm balling out at Dre's. I'm balling out at Taco El Gordo. And I'm balling out by sitting front seat at Usher at his, at his tour. I can't believe $20,000. Ah, uh, Martenzi, congrats. Welcome back. Take the win real quick. Oh, Kendrick Lamar, all I have to say is you've made my day. You've made my week. You've made my summer at your pop-out show in Los Angeles mm. the other night. Uh, I'm running on a high that will never go down. Thank all you. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Tim, you like to say that? Conversations he had with Connor McDavid was, I don't need you to worry about every single detail. Now, Knobloch has known McDavid for years. He coached him as a junior player when he was a teenager. And he's like, Connor, I don't need you to think about who you're going to play with or what time practice is. Just focus on hockey. And I think in the past, and Chris Knobloch confirmed this, all of those things had consumed Connor too much. And now his true self is shining through. All he cares about is winning and his work ethic. He leads by example for the rest of his teammates. We see what he's doing offensively the way he works defensively they say should be noticed too and when we think about the Oilers is always Connor McDavid and Leon Dreisaitl. Dreisaitl hasn't really produced in this series just two assists they both came in that 8-1 blowout and this morning Leon Dreisaitl said obviously I'm not happy with the way I'm playing his teammates though said that he's being a little too hard on himself Philip Broberg saying you know even when he's not feeling his best he's still better than 99% of players in the league but coach Chris Knobloch did tell me privately that he's predicting a big breakout game from Leon Dreisaitl maybe it happens tonight and if it does that place will be electric let's go to the other side here uh, you know head coach Paul Maurice said his team is staying loose how are they doing that well, Paul Maurice talked about the other times when they didn't clinch, and he said, we're not deflated, just grumpy. He also talked about the pressure shifting in this series. He said, the Oilers were playing with nothing to lose when they down, went down 3 nothing, And when you do that, you're a bit liberated on the ice. Well, now that we're in a 3-2 situation, which is more typical, we see this more often in hockey, this is a sport with great parity, it's evened out a bit, and really, it's anybody's game. I love what Matthew Kachuk said yesterday. You know, they went up 3 nothing. He goes, let's be honest, None of us thought this was going to be a four-game series. And talking about the team being loose, just consider this might be the biggest game of Sergei Bobrovsky, the goalie's life. This morning I saw a woman from catering rolling a big refrigerator through the concourse here, and Sergei Bobrovsky was helping her, just being a good helper. So <laughs> the guys are just kind of keeping normal, keeping loose, and hoping it helps tonight. Oh, that's a fantastic story. And you got the best seat in the house right there on the ice, Emily. Thank you so much. Cannot wait for game six tonight. More live coverage here coming up on SportsCenter, how the atmosphere Atmosphere in Edmonton will affect the Panthers as they try to close out the cup tonight. Steve Levy and our NHL crew standing by ahead. Kansas Governor Laura Kelly signed legislation today that could help her state lure the Kansas City Chiefs and the Kansas City Royals away from neighboring Missouri. The legislation would both help teams pay for new practice and game facilities in Kansas. The Missouri-Kansas border splits the Kansas City area with about 60% of the population residing on the Missouri side where the Chiefs and Royals currently play. For much more on this story, NFL reporter Jeremy Fowler joins us. What can you add to this developing situation? Yeah, Kevin, the sense is that the state of Kansas has put together a viable option now for the Kansas City Chiefs and that the state of Missouri is in the early stages of putting together that option. Once they do, then this, the Kansas City Chiefs will have two options to consider. This is not a situation where they're looking to move the team out of those states or go to Dallas or anywhere like that. So they will be in their home base. But the sense is timing is of the essence for the Chiefs because it takes at least a couple years to design and plan one of these new stadiums, at least a couple years to build it. So that lease up to 2031 on Arrowhead 
is getting closer than people would think. Yeah, keep in mind, Arrowhead Stadium has been the home of the Chiefs since 1972. It is a fantastic venue, certainly home field advantage we've seen in the postseason with the Chiefs making their runs the last few years. All right, let's talk contracts and some players here, Alvin Kamara and yep. Brandon Ayuk. What can you tell us about developments with these two guys? Yeah, well, Kamara wants a new deal, missed that last day of minicamp. That was contract related. The Saints and Kamara's reps have had talks about a reworked contract, but nothing has materialized as of yet. So the hang-up is he's got two years left on his deal, almost $12 million this year, but 2025 is the issue. He's got $25 million of non-guaranteed money that's untenable for both the player and the team. So Kamara's open to a rework two-year deal, maybe strengthen his guarantees. Christian McCaffrey got his done in San Francisco early. Kamara's hoping for the same thing. We'll see if the Saints can find a sweet spot there. And then Brandon Ayuk, he's emerged as one of the better receivers in the league, wants to be paid like it. The 49ers do want Ayuk back. They are willing to pay him, but there's a price point that both sides have to be comfortable with. 49ers haven't shown just yet that they're willing to meet that massive exploding running back market where $30 million is just a footnote now where it used yeah. to be so far from reality. So we'll see if they can get there. They've had a pension for paying past players, including Debo Samuel, star wide receiver two years ago. So they got five or six.